Four Mile House is the oldest standing structure in Denver. That building was built when Abraham Lincoln was the president, when Colorado was not even a territory. It is a place where nobody famous lived, nothing famous happened, but it basically represents a great piece of social history. If you can imagine, you've been on the trail for two weeks, a very, very long trek across the great American desert. The journey itself was a challenge. It was a bumpy, rough ride. Very dry terrain. You're hungry for a clean bed and a clean bath and maybe a good stiff shot of whiskey and Four Mile House provided all of those and more. Four Mile House was the last stop before you reached Denver. This program was funded by the History Colorado State Historical Fund. Supporting projects throughout the state to preserve, protect, and interpret Colorado's architectural and archaeological treasures. History Colorado State Historical Fund. Create the future. Honor the past. With support from the Denver Public Library and History Colorado. With additional funding and support from these fine organizations. And viewers like you. Thank you. For most of the 19th century, people viewed the region that became Colorado as part of the Great American Desert. It was a barrier that needed to be overcome in order to get from the United States to California. It was forbidding terrain, and it wasn't a place that you went to if you had any sense, because as far as most Americans understood, there wasn't anything of value here. The attraction to move west began after Lewis and Clark came back with some very fascinating stories about what was going on out in the West. And that was followed by Zebulon Pike and Stephen Long. Along about 1849, gold was discovered in California. The people that were looking for gold in California happened to stop by Colorado and found some gold. Word got out and people started coming to Colorado looking for gold. And so wagon roads started to be formed by running wagons along rivers. In the 1850s, this area would have had nomadic Indian tribes, and it would have looked somewhat like Eastern Colorado does now if you take away the farmer's fields. Uh, this would have been an arid area with just some trees along the creeks. It was a frontier. While there had been trappers and traders back into the 1830s, certainly before that, some Spanish exploration, there really wasn't much going on in this part of the world. In 1858 and 1859, at the beginning of the Pikes Peak Gold Rush, this area was part of four different territories, Nebraska, Kansas, New Mexico, and Utah. There was no Colorado Territory. There was just a little tiny village of Denver. It was one of several little competing villages. This was not an area that was very well known back in the United States, as they used to say. Gold brought people to Denver. It had been discovered down right about at the confluence of Cherry Creek and the Platte River. Denver was founded by people who hoped to get rich, not only mining gold, but mining the miners who came out here. Lots of people came from the Midwest and also the East Coast. The Eastern U.S. was in a financial depression. Lots of people were out of work. There are even stories of people arriving here pushing their worldly belongings in wheelbarrows. The mood of the nation was very unsettled. The conflict between the North and the South was beginning to heat up. The California gold rush had sort of played out. The very early days were wild. You could stake a claim and position yourself for either hopefully a great prospect as a gold miner or certainly a key player in the transportation scene. Tens of thousands of people left the United States in the hope of seeking wealth in the Rocky Mountains. Denver at this time period was more of a lean-to, kind of shanty town, organized around Confluence Park. Denver was a bustling town. It was beginning to supply these mountain towns where the gold was actually being panned. More miners going into the mountains 
but in order to get to the mountains, you first had to come to Denver. Crossing the plains was never easy or cheap. For an average day laborer, the cost of a stagecoach ticket was probably more than they could afford. They were gonna to have to find another way. A steamboat could have taken you down the Ohio River, up the Mississippi, up the Missouri River. To get to Colorado, you would have wanted to get off your steamboat in a place like present-day Kansas City, or maybe St. Joseph, Missouri, or Omaha and Council Bluffs. There were frauds which said you could take a steamboat all the way up the Platte River. The Platte River was about a foot deep in those days, just like it is today. From your place that you embarked on the, off the Missouri River, you were on your own. Families would have traveled to Colorado in small covered wagons. They would pack up the necessities from their home back east. Unless you were really elderly, sick, or a newborn, you wouldn't be in the wagon. You'd be walking alongside it. So it was a long foot journey out here. Multiple trails led into Denver. We're on the Cherokee Trail, which came up from southerly locations. A new trail, the Emigrant Trail, had come in off the Oregon Trail, following the Platte River, about where Interstate 76 is today. If you followed a longer trail, say along the Platte River, you had water. But if you took the shorter trails across Kansas, including the Smoky Hill Trail, you ran out of water. In the early days, travelers along the Smoky Hill Trail would lose their way and not be able to find food or water. So it was known in the earliest years as the Starvation Trail. A very fast stagecoach could do it in a matter of days, but, but you could expect to spend a couple of weeks on the trail. It was a bumpy, rough ride. We're talking about deeply rutted dirt roads. Many of the stagecoaches were suspended on slings of leather and steel, so that as you jostled around, it wasn't the thumping and hard bumping that you would have on like a Conestoga wagon. It was as good as it could get with padded seats, but it was a very long, long journey. Traveling in a stagecoach was the most luxurious accommodation that was available at the time, but it was still pretty primitive. You cram into this cramped, confined Concord stage. There might be five or six passengers. Nobody's washing. Uh, some of them might be imbibing as you go along. Well, that went on day after day after day after day, and maybe on Sunday they would take a little break, do some laundry, do a little rest, uh, have a little fun, and then start in again. They had to do this early in the spring. They didn't want to be coming out here in the winter time. They were leaving about the time the tornadoes were starting. Thunderstorms, wildfires. Encounters with wild animals, perhaps bandits or ruffians on the road. Your wagon could break down in the middle of nowhere. But if you're an American in the mid 19th century, this is the adventure of a lifetime. You are seeing landscapes that you have only dreamt about or read about. You're encountering wildlife like bison and coyotes and jackrabbits. You're encountering Indians and trappers and mountain men. And for many people who came across the plains, they knew that this was going to be an unforgettable experience. Very quickly after the Pikes Peak Gold Rush, private companies began providing stage service from the United States to Denver City in, in the territories. The most sophisticated of them, such as the Overland Stage Company, developed their own stage stops. They would divide the route between the United States and Salt Lake City into divisions, and each division agent would be responsible for recruiting stagecoach drivers, finding the horses, and establishing the way stations along the way so that a stagecoach could travel relatively swiftly from stop to stop to stop, stopping only long enough to change out the tired horses and mules for a fresh team or to provide some accommodations for the travelers. In time, these private stage networks stretched all over the West, branch lines into the mountains to Cheyenne, down into New Mexico and Arizona. Before the railroad came, stagecoaches were the way to travel around in the West. A wayside inn in the 1860s would have been a lot like what we think of rest stops today, if rest stops could also have kind of a hotel component to them. The accommodations in those home stations varied wildly. Some of them were very luxurious. Some of them were extremely primitive. Mark Twain took a stagecoach across Colorado and across the plains in the 1860s 
described a meal that was rancid and, and, and the water was foul and there was a common wash basin with, with brown, kind of gooey water. And a community toothbrush. And at that time, that was just common practice. And a comb that everybody shared as well, and, and a washcloth that he said just didn't bear considering. The Brantner brothers came from Ohio, and their profession was more in the barrel making industry. And you can see that in the architecture of the Four Mile House. They made their way out to Colorado to start farming, and they happened upon this homestead, it had squatters' rights for 160 acres, and then built the original part of the structure in 1859. They had a German ancestry, and uh, they were great skilled builders. This is an absolutely beautiful log house. It was not called Four Mile House yet. It would have just been called a log house. The roof line in the loft portion is curved like a barrel beautifully dovetailed joints. The logs running through the ceiling of the main floor were hand-hewn logs that we have dated back to coming from the pinery in this area. The Brantners felt that to run any kind of a farm that supplied the settlers, their prospects were better northeast of Denver along the other trail. They were here for a short period of time, only a year. They ended up moving north to Henderson, Colorado, where they became primarily farmers. Once the Brantner brothers decided that they wanted to move on, they sold to Mary Cocker. Mary, who was a widow from Green Bay, Wisconsin, took over. And while the Brantners had run a family farm and family farms along trails were expected to take in travelers and help them out, Mary turned it into a mile house. A mile house was kind of a general store. You could buy and sell goods there, have dinner. Every so often along a trail system, you could stop, rest your horses, get them water. You could yourself get a bite to eat or a drink. You could socialize with other travelers. But then if need be, if it was late at night, you could also rent a bed. As you traveled closer to Denver, the stage stations began getting names, which indicated to you, the passenger, how far away you were from reaching your destination. They measured miles from trail junctions, and in this case, the trail junction was right about where our state capital is. If you were coming up the Smoky Hill Trail, you would stop at the 20-mile house, and then the 12-mile house, and then the 9-mile house, and the last stop before you reached Denver was the 4-mile house. Being so close to the destination, more than likely, it was the last chance for these passengers to freshen up. To get out of their dusty road clothes, and put on their cravats and their jackets and the women in their, their dresses, their fine dresses and hats. So when they reached Denver, they could step out of that stagecoach into the streets of Denver and look like they just left a fancy hotel. For a Mile House was that costume changing point where people could make the change so they could have a grand entrance into Denver. Why was Four Miles convenient? People were coming out strictly in wagons. The wagons were usually pulled by oxen maybe sometimes by draft horses. And these animals uh, needed uh, to have a break about every three to five miles. Four Mile House was an established stop along the Cherokee Trail into Denver. It was simply one piece in a transportation network which connected California to the East Coast. And so when you think about this place in, in kind of continental scale, Four Mile House is serving an extremely important role in, in the project of, of Americanizing North America. There was probably one stagecoach a day. But there were accommodations on the second floor, a large open sleeping room initially, and there could have been many overnight passengers that weren't stagecoach passengers, people just stopping. There were large corrals. There was water here. It, it was a safe distance from the bustling city where all kinds of craziness was going on. Mary was the primary cook. She and her daughter would have played hostess to everyone, and her son would have helped any gentlemen coming through with their teams of horses or getting kind of the animal livestock taken care of. He would also play host to the men in the tavern because women weren't allowed in that part of the house. The strongest beverage sold in our bar was Taos Lightning. Taos Lightning was at least 180 proof alcohol sweetened with things like strychnine, tan bark, and gunpowder. And it probably got a little rowdy down there. 
card games would have been going on, a fiddler would have been playing, and Mary Calker would allow the female travelers to come in the side door, not even have to deal with the Tahoe's lightning swilling riffraff. She could run that bar and handle any man who was twice her size who'd had too much Tahoe's lightning. Mary's wagon train encountered not very friendly Indians, and Mary saved them. And the way she saved them was this little woman reached in her mouth, pulled out her false teeth, and went like this at the Indians. And the Indians were sure she was a witch, and they fled. Mary ran an orderly house. If you got disorderly, she would show you the door. She was a very independent, vivacious woman, was very entrepreneurial, and started her own wayside inn as a woman in this part of the country. In 1860, it was a pretty dangerous occupation. In 1864, a huge flood had gone down our little Cherry Creek. The friendly Arapaho and Cheyenne Indians had warned the whites, look out for that creek, it will flood. And the whites evidently didn't believe them. Four Mile House luckily was just high enough, but you had flood debris everywhere. Mary was very discouraged. About that time, Mary encountered other people from Wisconsin. The Booth family had just arrived. Mary was from Green Bay and they were from Madison. That may be one reason they liked each other. The Booth family purchased Four Mile House from Mary Cocker. They struck a deal and the Booths bought Four Mile House for $800. So they continued to operate the home as a wayside inn for a few years. Millie and Levi Booth very quickly expanded the operations. They expanded beyond being a simple stage station to having a farm and to producing honey and livestock and apple orchards, ultimately growing wheat. He built three irrigation ditches and got the water rights from Cherry Creek to irrigate all these lands. Making the area into a thriving farm community. The Booth family struck a deal with the Butterfield Stage Company. The deal was that Butterfield stage would have just come a long distance. They would have used trail horses to get it across the plains. These horses were very tired. Here at Four Mile House, they would switch horses. Levi Booth would arrange to take care of the trail horses and outfit the stage with some new fresh horses which were known to be high spirited. The stage would roar into downtown Denver, which was a great sales ploy if you wanted to travel to Butterfield Stage. In time, Four Mile House became a very important hub of a rural community. It became not only a supplier for travelers, but, but actually a producer that produced the goods that people needed as they moved back and forth. Four Mile House was a crossroads for people who were trying to reach Denver in the mines. It was really a little mini settlement outside of Denver where all of the goods from the farms and all of the travelers came together. They were able to turn a 160 acre piece of land into over 600 acre farm. Millie also ran small industry businesses out of her home. She had a butter making business on the side as well. So she was quite the entrepreneur herself. She helped kickstart what we know of as an agricultural grange in this area. They were very instrumental in starting schools in the area. But then a couple of things happened. The Butterfield Stage Company eventually went bankrupt. Then the railroad arrived in Denver in 1870. And after that, no one needed to travel to Denver through the old Cherokee Trail right by Four Mile House anymore. They could just ride the train. That spells the end of the glory days of, of the stagecoaching era. Stage stations like Four Mile House begin to fade, but they don't quite go away, because even with the arrival of railroads, branch stage lines serve the railroads, so places like Four Mile House continued to have some importance in the community. The owners of Four Mile House made a very successful transition to a broader contributor to the farming community. Four Mile House was at the agricultural heart of that farming community well into the 20th century. The family would live here over three generations all the way up to 1945. The heirs to the 600 acres eventually sold it and ended the Booth's connection with the property. So the Four Mile House by the late 60s looked like it was in shambles. It was just really in bad condition when the city purchased the property. The house was literally boarded up. Everything had been painted white, including the brick. The chimneys 
had been restored and the city had put a new roof on it in 77. The grounds were barren. It had been a dump. The building itself was pretty dismal looking. In 1975, Glendale was going through a bit of a boom of its own. Post-war single-family homes, the American dream, was taking place all around the Four Mile House property. And there were many apartments being built around the Four Mile House site. There was an intense pressure to find land by developers, and the rumor was the old Four Mile House, with about 12 acres surrounding it, was going to be scraped off and made into a condominium complex. The park people really helped to save this place and start the restoration process. Four Mile House is the oldest standing structure in Denver. During the restoration process, they did carbon dating with the hand-hewn logs that are used in the ceiling of the main floor, and that's how they were able to determine that the home was constructed with wood from 1858, early 59. An 1859 house, which had an 1883 addition, and it's now the 1970s. I'm visualizing maybe, maybe this was a 1950s house that had shag carpeting. It had modern conveniences, Modern walls were taken down to sometimes expose the old original log walls. Glass in some of our windows that we can tell is the historic glass. We have a lot of old pictures of our volunteers and all the work they did to take Four Mile House back to what it had been. The original log house, as you see it today, is pretty much the same as the Brantners built it, a two-story log house, not a cabin. It had a earlier addition and an outside staircase that led to the second floor. So that was removed to make way for this 1883 addition. The original house was, was probably exposed logs. Exposed logs was kind of considered a crude and not a elevated look. And so very, very shortly after the log house was built, it was clabbered it over to disguise its humble beginnings. Our idea was to interpret the years 1859 to 83 and show that change from you know, being a wayside inn and a stagecoach stop to being a diversified agricultural farm. So what you see here today in terms of the barns and the corrals and the buildings and the way, somewhat the way the, the site is laid out and used is similar to how it progressed over that period of time. Four Mile House represents our past, the good and the bad. For 21st century city dwellers, what they find here is a green oasis. Life is a little slower here. Preserving a location like this also gives people a sense of place and a sense of time and how they fit into the storyline of their own history. It's really important to preserve places like this in the fabric of our urban setting. This is surrounded on all sides by a modern city. But in here, there's sort of a bubble in the past, and it lets us be reflective of who we are and who we want to be. We have many different types of visitors. Hi, everybody. School groups that can come year round. They engage in what the experience moving out west was packing up your home, what you would have left, what you would have taken, the journey west. Then we go through and talk about settlement in the area, how you would have homesteaded. There weren't established neighborhoods like we see today. They would have had the animals, chickens, goats, dairy cattle, and a barn for the horses. We also have an old trapper's cabin here, and we have a root cellar. What we envision for Four Mile Historic Park moving forward is becoming a more engaging historic landmark. We'll continue to have artifacts on display and historic demonstrations. We also want the visitor to be able to take part in that process and really kind of get their hands dirty and really experience what life would have been like. We want this site to continue to be recognized as a significant historical place in Denver's history. As much as anything else, the Four Mile House today is about uh, the, the essential nature of farming. We're so disconnected from the source of our food. Four Mile House is a place where you can come and, and reestablish those connections. By running a small model farm here on the site, children learn the sources of their food and they learn a little more about the cycle of food production. This is a place where you can come and you can really learn about your connection to agriculture and to the land. We are the gatekeepers. 
we are the ones who have to keep this, use it carefully, and then pass it on. You had your history book in front of you when you were in grade school, but how about you get to go see Four Mile House and really visualize what it was like? The Brantners and Mary Cocker and her children and the Booth family were really great stewards of this property and of this home itself. And Four Mile Historic Park as an organization now wants to continue to be a similar good steward to the area and to the community and we want to leave this place better than we found it. The legacy is that they lived here, I think more so than you know what they accomplished. The Brantners being true pioneers and Mary Cocker, you know, the serial female entrepreneur. And then the Booth family, an agricultural family, smart, sophisticated. They represent the story of most of the people who came to Colorado. And as Colorado becomes a more transient state, this gives us a, a notion that we've always been a state of immigrants, people seeking new opportunities, looking for the next big chance and needing the help and the support that a place like Four Mile House provided for its travelers 150 years ago.